El Nashar and the Oxen by Rudyard Kipling. Read for LibriVox.org by Malcolm Fisher of Dover, England. El Nashar and the Oxen. There's a pasture in a valley where the hanging woods divide, and a herd lies down and ruminates in peace, where the pheasant rules the nooning and the owl the twilight tide and the war cries of our world die out and cease here i cast aside the burden that each weary weekday brings and delivered from the shadows i pursue on peaceful postless sabbaths i consider weighty things such as sussex cattle feeding on the dew at the gate beside the river where the trouty shallows broad, I know the pride that Logan Gula felt when he bade the bars be lowered of the royal cattle corral, and fifteen miles of oxen took the veldt. From the walls of Bulabeo, in unbroken file, they came to where the Mount of Council cuts the blue. I have only six and twenty, but the principle's the same with my Sussex cattle feeding in the dew. To a luscious sound of tearing, where the clovered herbage rips, level-backed and level-bellied, watch them move. See those shoulders, guess that heart girth, praise those loins, admire those hips, and the tail set low for flesh to make above. Count the broad, unblemished muzzles, test the kindly, mellow skin, and, where yon heifer lifts her head at call, mark the bosom's just abundance neath the gay and clean-cut chin, and those eyes of Juno overlooking all. Here is colour, form and substance, I will put it to the proof, and next season in my lodges shall be born some very bull of Mithras, flawless from his argat hoof, and to his even branching ivory dust-tip horn. He shall mate with block-square virgins. King shall seek him like in vain. I will multiply his stock a thousandfold. Till a hungry world extols me, builder of a lofty strain that turns one standard ton at two years old. There's a valley under oakwood where a man may dream his dream. In the milky breath of cattle laid at ease till the moon o'ertops the alders, and her image chills the stream, and the river mist runs silver round their knees. Now the footpaths fade and vanish, now the ferny clumps deceive, now the hedgerow folk possess the fields anew, now the herd is lost in darkness, and I bless them as I leave, my Sussex cattle feeding in the dew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Anvil A poem by Rudyard Kipling concerning the Norman conquest of 1066 and read by Malcolm Fisher of Dover, England for LibriVox.org The Anvil England's on the anvil, hear the hammers ring Clanging from the Severn to the Tyne. Never was a blacksmith like our Norman king, England's being hammered, hammered, hammered into line. England's on the anvil, heavy are the blows, but the work will be a marvel when it's done. Little bits of kingdoms cannot stand against their foes, England's being hammered, hammered, hammered into one. There shall be one people, it shall serve one lord, neither priest nor baron shall escape. It shall have one speech and law, soul and strength and sword. England's being hammered, hammered, hammered into shape. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Clancy of the Overflow by Andrew Barton Banjo Person. Went for Wimble Fox or Dog by Gwen O'Brien. www.glamourbrien.net
I had written him a letter, which I had, for want of better knowledge, sent where I met him down at Rockland years ago. He was showing when I knew him, so I sent a letter to him, just on spec, addressed as follows, Clancy of the Overflow. And an answer came directed in a writing unexpected, and I think the same was written with a thumbnail dipped in tar. Trust his shearing made you wrote it, and verbatim I will quote it. Chris has gone to Queensland driving, and we don't know where we are. In my wild, erratic fancy, visions come to me of Clancy, gone to driving down to Cooper where the western drivers go. As the sucker saw his stringing, Clancy rides behind him singing, but the drivers throw as precious, but the townsfolk never know. And the bush has friends to meet him, and the kindly voices greet him in the murmur of the breezes and the river on its bars. And he sees the vision splendid of the sunlit plain extended, and at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. I am sitting in my dingy little office, where a stingy ray of sunrise struggles feebly down between the houses tall. And the fetid air and gritty of the dusty, dirty city, through the open window floating, spreads its fineness over all. And in place of lowing cattle, I can hear the fiendish rattle of the tramways and the buses making hurry down the street, and the language uninviting of the gutter children fighting comes fitfully and faintly through the ceaseless tramp of feet. And the hurrying people daunt me, and their pallid faces haunt me as they shoulder one another in their rush and nervous haste, with their eager eyes and greedy, and their stunted forms and weedy, for townsfolk have no time to grow, they have no time to waste. And I somehow rather fancy that I'd like to change with Crancy, but to take a turn at troving where the seasons come and go. Where he faced the wild eternal of the cash book in the channel, but I doze to the others, Crancy of the Overflow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Clear Midnight by Walt Woodman. Read for LibriVox.org by Haley Teats. This is the hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done, thee fully forth emerging, silent gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best, night, sleep, death, and the stars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gentlemen Rankers by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Malcolm Fisher of Dover, England Gentlemen Rankers To the legions of the lost ones, to the cohort of the damned, to my brethren in their sorrow overseas, sings a gentleman of England, cleanly bred, machinely crammed, and a trooper of the Empress, if you please. Yea, a trooper of the forces, who has run his own six horses, and faith he went the pace and went it blind. And the world was more than kin while he held the ready tin, but today the sergeant's something less than kind. We're poor little lambs who've lost our way. Ba, ba, ba. We're little black sheep who've gone astray. Ba, ya, ba. Gentlemen rankers, out on the spree, damned from here to eternity, God have mercy on such as we, bar, ya, bar. Oh, it's sweet to sweat through stables, sweet to empty kitchen slops, and it's sweet to hear the tales the troopers tell, to dance with blousy housemaids at the regimental hops, to thrash the cad who says you waltz too well. Yes, to make you cock a hoop, to be rider for your troop, and branded with a blasted worsted spur. When you envy, oh how keenly, one poor Tommy living cleanly, who blacks your boots and sometimes calls you sir. If the home we never write to, and the oaths we never keep, and all we know most distant and most dear, Across the snoring barrack room return to blake our sleep. Can you blame us if we soak ourselves in beer? When the drunken comrade mutters and the great guard lantern gutters, 
and the horror of our fall is written plain every secret self-revealing on the aching whitewashed ceiling do you wonder that we drug ourselves from pain we have done with hope and honour we are lost to love and truth we are dropping down the ladder rung by rung and the measure of our torment is the measure of our youth god help us for we knew the worst too young our shame is clean repentance for the crime that brought the sentence a pride it is to know no spear of pride and the curse of reuben holds us till an alien turf enfolds us and we die and none can tell them where we die we're poor little lambs who've lost our way ba ya ba we're little black sheep who've gone astray ba a a gentlemen rankers out on the spree damned from here to eternity god have mercy on such as we ba ya ba end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Hopes Painted by the Autumn Cold by Sergei Yosenin Translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarbolinsky Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Hopes Painted by the autumn cold are shining. My steady horse plods on like quiet fate. His moist, dun lip is catching at the lining when the coat, flapping, flutters and falls straight. On a far road the unseen traces, leading neither to rest nor battle, lure and fade. The golden heel of day will flash receding and labors in the chest of years be laid. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Clear Cold by Sergei Yosenin Translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarbolinsky Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. In the clear cold the dales grow blue and tremble, the iron hooves beat sharply knock on knock, the faded grasses in wide skirts assemble flung copper where the wind-blown branches rock. From empty straws a slender arch ascending, fog curls upon the air and moss-wise grows, and evening Low among the wan streams bending, In their white waters washes his blue toes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 4 from Four Sonnets I shall forget you presently, my dear. By Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle I shall forget you presently, my dear, So make the most of this, Your little day, your little month, Your little half a year, Ere I forget, or die, or move away, And we are done forever. By and by I shall forget you, as I said, but now, if you entreat me with your loveliest lie, I will protest you with my favourite vow. I would indeed that love were longer lived, And oaths were not so brittle as they are. But so it is, and nature has contrived To struggle on without a break thus far. Whether or not we find what we are seeking, is idle, biologically speaking. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kraken by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Natasha Future. 
below the thunders of the upper deep far far beneath in the abysmal sea his ancient dreamless uninvaded sleep the kraken sleepeth faint as sunlights flee about his shadowy sides above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height and far away into the sickly light from many a wondrous and secret cell unnumbered and enormous polypi winnow with giant arms the lumbering green there hath he lain for ages and will lie battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep until the latter fire shall heat the deep then once by man and angels to be seen in roaring he shall rise and on the surface die end of poem this recording is in the public domain loveliest of trees the cherry now by a e houseman read for librivox dot org by l green loveliest of trees the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride wearing white for easter tide now of my threescore years and ten twenty will not come again and take from seventy springs a score it only leaves me fifty more and since to look at things in bloom fifty springs are little room about the woodlands i will go to see the cherry hung with snow end of poem this recording is in the public domain may by Sarah Teasdale, read for LibriVox.org. May. The wind is tossing the lilacs, the new leaves laugh in the sun, and the petals fall on the orchard wall, but for me the spring is done. Beneath the apple blossoms I go a wintry way, for love that smiled in April is false to me in May. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Men I Might Have Married by Jesse Pope Recorded for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding 1. The pauseless cawing of the rooks Fills me with secret agitation. The murmuring of mountain brooks Renews in full an old sensation. And when, in woodlands moist and thin, Where yesterday the mavis carolled, I hear the cricket's ceaseless din, Instinctively I think of Harold. He was a man of ample views, Of lofty brain and noble presence. Incited by the daily news, He sifted tariffs to their essence or in a voice of rolling sound he thundered out titbits of browning on primal law he would expound or how to save the nearly drowning the punster's wit he did abhor he loathed an atmosphere of laughter a waiting hush must fall before he spoke and silence follow after and so he walked with me apart with facts and figures plied and proved me mine was till then a simple heart nor had i nerves till harold loved me i was his choice when all was said and if i ventured to dispute it he proved by logic we must wed and i was powerless to refute it but ere the wedding day drew near my hand in sad farewell extending i told him i could hardly hear and total deafness was impending for once he answered not a word beneath the blow he fairly staggered that he should speak and not be heard it was enough to make him haggard he conjured up our married days the vision made his bosom harden when what can't hear you what do you say would alternate with 
beg your pardon so harold left me with a kiss his heart was firm he did not falter and very shortly after this he led another to the altar and though with ill-befitting haste i cast aside that threatened illness it left behind a settled taste for absolute unbroken stillness two to Geoffrey I was much attached, his ardour was unshaken. Our friends declared us nicely matched, nor were our friends mistaken. Indeed, we never had a spa until he bought a motor car. At first my joy was unconfined, the prospect was unclouded. I wore a coat, chinchilla lined, a cap with chiffon shrouded diurnal spins with lunch for two i planned alas i little knew the carburetta spoiled our fun then something started squeaking or else exploded like a gun the tires were always leaking we had a puncture then a burst but geoffrey's temper was the worst he stifled with a muttered growl attempts at conversation and hurtled over flesh and fowl to reach his destination a look of crime was on his face his fingernails were a disgrace that car despoiled him of his youth he'd brood on her for hours and yet he seldom spoke the truth when bragging of her powers and if the traffic wouldn't clear his language wasn't fit to hear he bought her such expensive things and lavished every penny on hoods and bonnets belts and rings he never bought me any his manner grew absorbed or rough until i said i'd had enough i told him frankly to decide i spoke without emotion between a motor and a bride i'd share no man's devotion the lack of me his life would mar he said but thought he'd choose the car three bob was a sympathetic soul his generosity was noted i can't sufficiently extol his courtesy so often quoted his work achieved a marked success his brain was keen his nerve perfection and yet at games i must confess his clumsiness was past correction at golf he'd mutilate the ground his strength was huge but unadjusted he'd swing himself completely round and sit upon the tee disgusted he'd hack the bunkers right away while clubheads through the air went hissing and after bob had had a day the links themselves were mostly missing though bob was loved by not a few yet billiards won him savage strictures he'd burst the pockets with his cue or make his ball bombard the pictures or when with oscillating gun he aimed at partridges or plover he'd make the other sportsmen run like rabbits for the nearest cover nor was he different at a dance for like a hulk that rolls and pitches he cleft a cumbersome advance amid the sound of rending stitches and when with innocent intent he frolicked as the tune went faster and fell as fall he must he sent a baker's dozen to disaster so when he vowed with tragic voice his heel upon my flounces setting i was his one and only choice all former love affairs forgetting and on the tray unwisely sat where claret cup and ices mingle i gently intimated that i thought it safer to be single four a sense of humour is my shield my jokes are glib if humble and yet to no man will i yield my liberty to grumble and montague my temper sorely tried by always looking on the sunny side if i anathematized the rain my grief he never heeded remarking that to swell the grain another inch was needed of picnics he'd observe 
we'd had our share, and disappointments we must grin and bear. Or when at golf I met defeat, his fortitude was fearful. He made my misery complete. No wonder I was tearful. The best must always win in every strife, he said, and patience is the salt of life. When I was grossly overcharged for frocks that never fitted, and on my grievances enlarged, he neither helped nor pitied. Annoyances like that, he said, were small. Some human beings had no clothes at all. Or if, when toothache racked me through, my cheek became inflated, he always took a Spartan view of ills so overrated. What was my pain, he'd answer with aplomb, to that of people shattered by a bomb? I broke my vows when all was done from sheer exasperation. I really failed to see the fun of lifelong resignation. And when he argued, angry and distressed, I merely said, Whatever is, is best. Five. MacNeil was a man I admired. He'd won international laurels. But his bosom was easily fired with a passionate craving for quarrels. From morning till night he spoiled for a fight. His hair was aggressively red. He sneered at a life lacking bloodshed and strife or a peaceable death in his bed. If I went a short journey by train with Mac as my stalwart protector, with the guard he would wage a campaign, or fall foul of the ticket collector. If the cabby should dare to ask more than his fare, very soon he perceived his mistake. And wherever we went, upon pleasure intent, I was most of the time on the shake. I quarrelled with numerous friends, or Mac did the quarrelling for me. And rather than offer amends, to cut every one he'd implore me. Though a challenge he hurled at the rest of the world, dissension with me he would shun, till it grew rather tame to be out of the game, so I entered the lists just for fun. I forget how the quarrel began, I remember quite well how it finished, how high personalities ran while our tender affection diminished. With visages flushed to the combat we rushed. Of course we said more than we meant. Then I told him to go. All was over. And so, to my utter amazement, he went. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Kingdom by Louisa May Alcott Read for LibriVox.org by Fiddlesticks A little kingdom I possess, where thoughts and feelings dwell, And very hard I find the task of governing it well. For passion tempts and troubles me, a wayward will misleads, And selfishness its shadow casts on all my words and deeds. How can I learn to rule myself, to be the child I should, Honest and brave, nor ever tire of trying to be good? How can I keep a sunny soul to shine along life's way? How can I tune my little heart to sweetly sing all day? Dear Father, help me with the love that casteth out my fear. Teach me to lean on Thee and feel that Thou art very near, that no temptation is unseen, no childish grief too small, since Thou with patience infinite doth soothe and comfort all. I do not ask for any crown but that which all may win nor seek to conquer any world except the one within. Be then my guide until I find, led by a tender hand, thy happy kingdom in myself, and dare to take command. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 3 from Four Sonnets Oh, think not I am faithful to a vow, by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org By Shakira Searle Oh, think not I am faithful to a vow. Faithless am I, save to love's self alone. Were you not lovely, 
I would leave you now. After the feet of beauty fly my own. Were you not still my hunger's rarest food, And water ever to my wildest thirst, I would desert you, think not but I would, And seek another as I sought you first. But you are mobile as the veering air, And all your charms more changeful than the tide, Wherefore to be inconstant is no care, I have but to continue at your side. So wanton, light, and false, my love, are you. I am most faithless when I most am true. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Sale by Auction of Keats's Love Letters by Oscar Wilde. Read for LibriVox.org by Samantha Panikian. On the Sale by Auction of Keats's Love Letters. These are the letters which Endymion wrote to the one he loved in secret and apart, and now the brawlers of the auction mart bargain and bid for each poor blotted note. I for each separate pulse of passion quote the merchant's price. I think they love not art who break the crystal of a poet's heart that small and sickly eyes may glare and gloat. Is it not said that many years ago, in a far eastern town, some soldiers ran with torches through the midnight and began to wrangle for mean raiment, and to throw dice for the garments of a wretched man, not knowing the god's wonder or his woe? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pig by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf It was the first of May, a lovely warm spring day. I was strolling down the street in drunken pride, but my knees were all a-flutter, and I landed in the gutter, and a pig came up and lay down by my side. Yes, I lay there in the gutter, thinking thoughts I could not utter, when a lady passing by did softly say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. And the pig got up and slowly walked away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Prouder Man Than You by Henry Lawson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles a prouder man than you if you fancy that your people came of better stock than mine if you hint of higher breeding by a word or by a sign if you're proud because of fortune or the clever things you do then i'll play no second fiddle i'm a prouder man than you if you think that your profession has the more gentility and that you are condescending to be seen along with me if you notice that i'm shabby while your clothes are spruce and new you have only got to hint it i'm a prouder man than you if you have a swell companion when you see me on the street and you think that i'm too common for your tony friend to meet so that i in passing closely fail to come within your view then be blind to me forever i'm a prouder man than you if your character be blameless if your outward past be clean while tis known my antecedents are not what they should have been do not risk contamination save your name whate'er you do birds of feather fly together i'm a prouder bird than you Keep your patronage for others, gold and station cannot hide. Friendship that can laugh at fortune, friendship that can conquer pride. Offer this as to an equal, let me see that you are true. And my wall of pride is shattered, I am not so proud as you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Phoebe, from the Bab Ballads, by W. S. Gilbert, read for LibriVox.org, 
by Shakira Searle. Gentle, modest little flower, sweet epitome of May, love me but for half an hour, love me, love me, little Fay. Sentences so fiercely flaming in your tiny shell like ear, I should always be exclaiming if I loved you, Phoebe dear. Smiles that thrill from any distance shed upon me while I sing. Please ecstaticize existence. Love me, O oh thou fairy thing. Words like these outpouring sadly, you'd perpetually hear. If I loved you fondly, madly. But I do not, Phoebe dear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Upon Green Hills by Sergei Yosainen Translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarbolinsky Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Upon green hills wild droves of horses blow the golden bloom off of the days that go. From the high hillocks to the bluing bay falls the sheer pitch of heavy manes that sway. They toss their heads above the still lagoon, caught with a silver bridle by the moon. Snorting in fear of their own shadow, they, to screen it with their manes, await the day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.